son, learn to get respected because of your mind and not because of your fashion. And I thought that was a very powerful message he gave to me. You know, he says that don't ever uh, make, you know, look around because people will respect you because of what you're wearing. They will respect you because of your mind. The second thing that he taught me, and I told this to my sons also, was that every morning when you wake up and you're standing in front of the mirror having a shave, if you can look at yourself in the eye and say, yesterday I did not do anything wrong, I did not harm anybody knowingly, my father used to say, you don't need to justify yourself to anybody else in the world. Do exactly what you want, hold your head eye and do what you want. The third thing he taught me, which I thought was, you know, I've always carried with me, is that you must have the courage to be able to say what's in your mind and not worry about what the other guy is going to think. If you're honest with what you have said, that other individual will understand. If they don't understand your honesty, they're not a friend worth having. You know, so there are some, some of the messages that I can remember uh, immediately. Correct. So, you know, I, I had to balance. I mean, remember that he was a very, very upright army soldier. So, you know, he was a straight shooter and he would say exactly what he felt. So first of all, it, it seems like uh, uh, there is a gap um, on faith mm -hmm. and expression in English before we move to America. Correct. Um, so your dad is, is in uniform. Mm -hmm. No, what the message was, and you know, we you see, you, he never said don't dress well. Dress well. But, you know, when I was growing up, bell bottoms were a big rage, right? They're coming back now. They're coming back now, bell bottoms. So I remember telling my father, you know, I need to get a new pair of trousers. And he would say, I can't afford it. And I said, no, but everyone's got, you know, you've got to be fashionable and you've got to do all these things. And that's when he would tell me that dress well, but not, don't dress only because you think society will accept you better because of the way you're dressing. Okay, you know, there's another thing that uh, you said you never spoke to Bill. Mm -hmm. And when we were in Chicago. I beg your pardon? Yeah, yeah. How important is living with Jewish forgiveness in your life? So, you know, we've, uh, Mel, we've all been brought up in, uh, in English language schools. I mean, we were all educated in what we call here Roman Catholic schools with Irish brothers. I can, I can hear that. Hmm. I, I couldn't understand your question. Okay. Uh, you know the, um, the uh, movie, My Fair Lady? I do. Okay, where they take um, Elijah Doolittle. Doolittle, yeah. Mm -hmm. on, uh, you know, the cross. And uh, they improve her language. And then she talks with Pharaoh. Correct. So how on earth do you think Uh, when I was growing up, I was working for a British company. I thought, I think English language, accent, etc., was important. When I moved to Singapore, and I must tell this story to you and to your viewers, uh, I thought I spoke good English. And I, I you know, uh, in my senior Cambridge, I was top of the class in India and so on. And I asked this young 21 year old Singaporean 
girl who was who had just joined us as a trainee, I said, you know, I can't understand the way you speak English. And full marks to her at 21, she said, Mr. Garg, I can't understand anything you say as well. Right? I, that is what taught me that it is not necessary for me to be able to speak the Queen's English. We should be able to communicate with one another because of what we say and what is the content of our message rather than our accent. Correct. Okay. So, uh, you know, we could see some projection in the image. Mm -hmm. And I see that you would love to get to know you better. Okay. That's a, a wonderful thing. But there is one paradox here. Mm -hmm. It's not meant to be harmful. Okay. But like you, I like to speak my mind. Okay. Right. But uh, you, by adopting it, I think you pick it up. You know, like okay. I see about your wife, you didn't tell me about all the things you failed at. You said, no, I had great success. So you could give compliments to nature. And I have a wonderful wife. And I listen to her company. And I published seven books with amazing publishers. And you made me very well. No, so let me let me let me tell you. I mean, I think I have failed. You're not a person who likes to fail. No, oh, well, I don't like to fail, <clears throat> but I have failed more than probably most other people would have failed. You know, uh, so uh, it's just that I've always said that you must have the mindset not to let failure get you down. I failed on in every possible thing. You know, uh, failed. As, 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 a, as a businessman, I failed as a manager. Some, I've had failures in relationships with, at home with children. You know, we've all had issues with every, you know, but I've always continuously worked at correcting that failure. So, uh, you know, it's like everyone says, if you fall down, instead of staying down, stand up, dust your clothes and start running again. Okay. So uh, I, th I think failure is something which has taught me a lot in terms of uh, how to look at life, how not to uh, let anything get you down. And uh, yet, you know, uh, irrespective of how difficult a situation or difficult day I may have had, I've always maintained that the moment my head hits my pillow, I'm out like a light. I have no problem in sleeping. So I can sleep anytime, anywhere. Okay. Because you had saved me a few years of writing a book which I wasn't even reading. <laughs> so my book will be out in February. I will send you a copy. Oh, many, many. I can tell you many failures. Well, okay, so I'll, I'll share one, which is which is you know public knowledge, and which is uh, so in 1990, 1996, when I left India Tobacco, I had I, I was in I was in the running for uh, getting the top job in a huge multi-billion-dollar company, and uh, I had this big showdown with the chairman of the company, huge showdown on things that we will not get into on in, on this uh, program. And uh, in my book, I have written that I came out of a board meeting. I thought I was the highest flying 36-year-old managing director of that company. And uh, the chairman of the company came. We stood in the big open hall. And I think tactically, he, made, he, made, he did that. We both came out of the boardroom, the stormy board meeting. And he made me stand in, in a large open hall with about 300 employees, open hall. And he said loudly to me, Ashutosh, 
I think it is time for you to look for another job. So he fired me. My reaction to him was, sorry, publicly, publicly. So my reaction to him was, sir, I have been with this company longer than you have, and I will be with this company longer than you ever will be. I walked back to my room and I rang up my wife and I said, I think it's time to leave. So, uh, you know, big failure. It took me a little time to get over that because I had never ever thought I would leave the company I had joined when I was 21 years old after my business school. Big failure. And other than that, there have been lots of failures, lots of small failures. You know, I think it's a daily uh, thing. Okay. So, so let me share with you, uh, I'm discovering a lot of these things now. So after I sold my business, uh, we have uh, uh, management schools in India called the Indian Institutes of Management, which are you know, rated in the top four, five, you know, top hundred schools in, in the world. So for two years in a row, I ran a program on entrepreneurship for the MBA students. And uh, so then after two years, uh, you know, it was a too much time commitment. So I decided I didn't want to continue any longer. But uh, they still have an open offer for me that, you know, like you, they've said that, you know, why don't you come and do your PhD? So I said, well, I'm not sure if I can give you that much time, but I'd love to think about it. Not just me. I, no, I don't do this for money. I think God's been very kind. We've got more than enough. But this is where I've, I've always disputed with anybody who says that, you know, you can do effort. Everybody can do anything they want. And in today's environment, I tell my children the same thing. When I was a student, I worked for a large company. The next day, you know, I resigned. Next day, I started another job. I tell my children, today's world offers our young people the opportunity to work in the corporate sector for 10 years. Then they want to become a musician. They can be, be a musician for five years. Then they say, I want to open a restaurant. Go and do that. Then they say, but I want to you know, act in a cinema. You can do that. So today's world is completely different from what I was brought up. I agree with you. But what I don't understand is why even open a restaurant, act in what? a movie. <laughs> now I want to talk about music. OK. Correct. And you play several classical arrangements for me. No, I, I just play the flute. Well, why didn't you do the flute? Well, I just thought, you know, we let's let's have a conversation. Uh, and uh, flute will keep for some other time. So I can have to have you back on the show to play the flute. Happy to be. Happy to be on your show. And, and um, what is your thing about Indian music? Did you, because uh, I grew up on the Beatles. Mm -hmm. So did I. And we're going to talk about that in a moment. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of, uh, for me, one of the greatest contributions of Indian culture mm -hmm. is what it did to Peter. Correct. Um, can you talk about this? How is Indian music different? And, and um, give some examples. So, you know, Mel, I, you know, I think in all music, there is a certain discipline that you have to follow, right? I mean, uh, music now is all, almost mathematical. You can, you can actually look at the same set of notes and you play those notes. The difference that is there in 
Indian classical music versus a lot of Western music is that the person who's playing the classical music instrument has the ability to innovate and experiment, but staying within those boundaries. So, you know, and, and you will see that when Indian concerts are happen, uh, an Indian flute player or an Indian uh, vocal singer could sing for uh, 45 minutes at a stretch. You know, because he's, he or she is really experimenting with the music and, you know, what is uh, absolutely incredible and someday I will maybe send you a thing, it's called Jugal Bandi when either a vocal a person and a, say someone playing a percussion instrument or a vocalist with a flutist. Uh, the vocalist sings certain notes and those, and then stops. And then the flute player plays exactly the same notes. Then the thing goes back to the vocalist and this is, this is the sparring with one another and they get into longer and longer pieces and looking at each other saying, okay, let me see if I'll get you. And the other one plays exactly what the first person has played and says, well, I've got you now, you, 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 you start playing. So it is this. Not allowed to play something similar to what he's playing? No. So if, I, if, I, if I'm playing something, then I stop, I play the notes and I pass it to you. And I expect you to play exactly the same notes that I have played. That's very difficult. It is. And that is what the fun part of the, the Indian music is, Indian classical music. So they keep throwing the ball from one side to the other, and this could go on for 20 minutes. So uh, it's fascinating. And you know, like, um, this is fascinating for me because one of the um, reasons that I left class classical music for jazz mm -hmm. is because of the concerto type more. Okay. Correct. Um, because I can I can sing what you sang a little bit differently. Or I have to sing this exactly like you sang. No, you can sing it the way you want. It's the notes. It's the notes and the intonations. Okay. So you know I've never sung Indian music mm -hmm. in my life. Okay. Okay. I, I fell in love with, with the Beatles and George Harrison. Yeah. You know, the Beatles were strongly influenced by uh, Indian music. And they have played with, they have played with Ravi Shankar, uh, one, of, one of the world's greatest sitar players. So they've, they've composed a lot of music with him. Okay. So what, we, what we're going to do now is an experiment. Mm -hmm. Because we'll probably fail, but there's no pig to fail. Mm -hmm. No, I won't. Let's stay away from, let's stay away from singing. Honestly, I would prefer to. Yeah, let let's stay away from. It. You know, I've I've got a very very bad throat, so, and I don't sing at all. So, I play the throw the flute. So, I know, I would love to, but no, I don't sing at all. Okay, so next time. Next time. Okay, no, but I would prefer, I mean, you know, I find you some some uh, other Indians who, who are happy to sing. I want you. <laughs> okay, no. so, so let's talk about the Beatles. Uh, okay. Do you have one favorite song? Well, many. I mean, you know, uh, uh, from from Love, Love Me Do to uh, the Kantar Abbey Road collection. I mean, you know, we still hear it. We still have the old vinyl records in our collection, my wife and I. So uh, you have that old? There you are. So I. <laughs> so uh, we 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 grew up uh, listening to a lot of Beatles. But what is fascinating about the Beatles? And I was telling my children this. I said the Beatles, with their music, 
have stood the test of time. So my children love the Beatles as much as I did. I give a whole academic course in your class. Oh, wow. I want to hug you now. OK. So you know, if, if, you're, if you're a Absolutely. Uh, our, our younger son is, 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 a, is a musician. He, he can, uh, he's a very senior corporate uh, leader, but he plays every instrument. He plays the tabla, which is percussion. He plays the, the, the guitar. Um, he, he has his own jamming group in the US. So he goes and jams and, you know, so, so he does all kinds of, he, he plays the piano. So, so he, he's there. and. But you know, we were talking of the Beatles. Do you remember a, a, a Beatles lookalike group called the Herman's Hermits? They were very popular. I, I know them very well. Okay. And I teach them. Okay. I have a Wesser um, and uh, Peter Moon. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, what I'm saying is that Herman's Hermits did not stand the test of time. I think so. I mean, I don't hear the generation, two generations below me listening to them at all. I played it for the children and this, ah, oh, it's okay, but not the Beatles. So I said, okay. But, but you know, you, if you're comparing, um, you know, apples and oranges. I agree. Herman's Hermits was cover group. I know. Um, but I have the same thing. There was another group in England called the Great Sad Five. I've heard them, but not that much. Okay. Because I say, you know, everybody remembers the Beatles and nobody remembers the Great Sad Five. Mm -hmm. But I personally like Herman's Hermits. So I like them too. I remember, I remember some songs and, you know. Another group that um, the, the Beatles wannabes mm -hmm. that um, people still remember. Like okay. That. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard of them. So it's a very interesting question. I'm giving a talk next month. Okay. On, um, the Beatles and Sammy and Paul. Wow. And I, I haven't written it yet, but I think mm -hmm. that um, you can write or give a talk or write a book about the Beatles and anything. There's books about the Beatles and management. How to mm -hmm. <laughs> True. True. Then ask me, I mean, answer my question. Ask me the question again. Okay. What is your one favorite song? Well, I, I, I think I like, like a lot of the uh, John Lennon songs. I like Imagine probably one of the best. Okay. So I, I, I don't think I'm going to get you to sing it. No, I don't sing it at all. I wish I could, but I don't sing. Okay. I will teach you. We'll have one, offline classes. Yes, and I want to have uh, more friends in India. Mm -hmm. um, I think that especially uh, given how Israel and India now have quite different sexual relationships. Yes. And this is a good sign to me. Correct. No, India and Israel have always had a strong relationship. It is now with our current prime minister that he has now, he was the first person to officially visit Israel for the first time. And, and now we have direct flights between New Delhi and Tel Aviv. So and of course, a that's a big thing. I agree. A lot of young Israelis coming. A lot of them. Well, I think I've shared everything, but yes, I do. I think as I was talking, I must tell you one other thing that I was, I was very passionately involved with, and that is, I uh, was I got the opportunity to serve on the board of the Global Alliance for Vaccines in Geneva, and vaccines, you know, is is very very uh, 
topical right now because of all the pandemic that we are going through. And, uh, you know, I served on that board for eight years and I continue to work as, a, as, as you know, informally as a Gavi ambassador. So uh, I think, you know, just, just that understanding of vaccines and what is going to come ahead for us and that life will get at some stage get back to normal is something that I think all the young people listening to us must know. Well, I think it will be a new normal. It will be a new normal. And this is something that the young people need to do because, uh, you know, uh, the, now that everybody is back to use the shopping to everybody around the world. Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, it will never go. I think what we will all miss is the incredible amount of social connects that we used to have when we met physically. I think that is something which is going to change for quite some time. But other than that, I think life will get back to normal. <laughs> the new normal. Absolutely. Uh, please send your copies of Nika Pantelio. So I'm making a hustle right now. Mm -hmm. uh, Will do? Okay. Is your book about your failures? Uh, well, it has got a lot of examples of my failures, but it is, uh, it's, it's also a lot of, uh, I must have spoken to about 200 people asking them about what their failures were. Ah, okay. So, uh, it just encapsulates lots of examples uh, so that when people read, they say, I'm not alone, we can all fail. That's great. So listen, it has been incredible. Thank you very much. And, and I really appreciate it. We meet again in a few weeks. Yes, we do. Then this time you can embarrass me next time. I know. I, I, and this time I'm gonna ask you to maybe not sing because I know you sing, but I'll probably ask you to do something different. <laughs> Thank you, and to you. Thank you. Bye-bye.